A couple weeks ago, we had Hurricane Fiona come through the Maritimes. We wanted to come here today, assess some damage, first of all, but also to talk about what other forest stewards like us could do in this situation. Many landowners are probably wondering why this happened. I think a lot of people have made the connection to climate change, of course. If we were to continue on the same trajectory that we're on right now, we can expect that, generally speaking, this region will get warmer and wetter. That increase in rainfall will be more than compensated for by the increase in temperatures. So although we'll get more rainfall and snowfall, the overall trajectory will actually be that we'll get more droughts in the future because of that increased evapotranspiration. On top of that, we can expect to have an increase in severe windstorms and extreme weather events. And like we just saw recently, major storms like Hurricane Fiona. We can also expect that because our winters won't be as cold as they once were, we'll see more and more insect pests and diseases moving into the region. And that has some pretty serious and devastating consequences also for our forests here. There are several factors that play into forests and their susceptibility. So some of the big ones have come as learnings after Hurricane Juan about 20 years ago. Wind speed obviously plays a really big role. We also learned that certain species are a lot more susceptible to wind than others. Anecdotally, we're already seeing that after Hurricane Fiona that the most severely hit species are, are those shallowly rooted species. Conversely, there are you know, some other species in the forest that tend not to have been affected quite as badly because they're more deeply rooted. The height of trees really made a difference. So the taller the tree, the more likely it was to get caught by those really big winds. And in the case of those shallowly rooted species, that, that was a pretty good recipe for getting tipped over. And many landowners probably also noticed that in wet areas, anywhere where there's regular wetness in the soil, would mean a shallow rooting as well, and that means that those places tended to experience more uh, wind throw than in more dry areas. So we're all trying to pick ourselves up after Fiona, um, trying to determine our best path forward and how to better protect our forests for the future and be more resilient against future storms. Unfortunately, in these times, you'll also find there are people who want to take advantage of that. You'll have people come forward and try to tell woodlot owners that it all needs to be knocked down or it's going to come down next time. This isn't the case. There's no reason that those trees left standing after this storm will remain standing after the next. Contractors and uh, landowners are going to have to work together an awful lot in the wake of this in order to realize the potential that their forests have. Many are going to be pressured to harvest in the wake of this and that pressure might lead them to making decisions they wouldn't otherwise make around the amount to remove and the harvest levels to, to engage in. On sites where there's a lot of big, nice red spruce on the ground, even when keeping biodiversity in mind, that, that's a site that's hard for anyone to not want to go clean up. That's, that's the trees that you've been growing for so long. That's, you know, big red spruce is, is the economic driver in Nova Scotia forestry. So, you know, that's a tough decision for a landowner to make to want to leave those there. You know, maybe there's some, some poor quality hardwoods, you know, small balsam fir, uh, you know, there's a lot of aspen on the ground. You're so much better off to just leave it there and leave it to rot, it, it'll create great habitat. A big thing for landowners to remember is that uh, like these windstorms are very, very natural. If you're thinking about your forest as just economics, sure, it's, it's a big loss, but uh, in terms of biodiversity, uh, there's a lot of good, uh, good opportunity. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not habitat destruction, it just changes it. You know, there's already some soil disturbance in, in a lot of the uprooted stumps, which is really not a bad thing. It, it creates a good seedbed for, for tree species like yellow birch that need, uh, that need uh, good exposure to, uh, to mineral soils. If you chose not to come in and do any harvesting here, uh, you don't run the risk of having soil compaction or rutting and any other tree damage to uh, the residual stand that actually remains standing. While you're foregoing some, some economic value, it, it's, it's actually probably better for the overall health and biodiversity of this lot in the long run to, uh, to leave as much as you can. If you've already had a big damaging event come through here, there can be problems with soils and potentially problems with erosion, especially if there's a lot of blowdown around, say, water courses or anything like that. So you want to be careful about not causing any more damage. Than, than has already happened. One thing I've found in the uh, almost 15 years that I've been working in, uh, in the forest in Nova Scotia, and especially even here in the, the portions of this stand that are intact, 
there's really not a lot of coarse woody material and especially not a lot of large down trees. Much of our working forest is lacking in coarse woody debris, snags and standing deadwoods. Maybe like the tree behind me, just leave it. It's it's hung up right now, but you can see it's it's it started to snap off mostly because it's rotten on the inside anyway so you know it's a lower economic value most of our salamander species tend to live underneath that rotted coarse woody material it, it tends to be really wet and uh, that's the type of habitat that they like there's lots of fur there's some red spruce a little bit of hardwood coming up in here as it continues to grow and then that tree hits the ground that becomes a great drumming log for for something like a rough growth so if you come in and take those trees away you're just taking away that opportunity to uh, to create that habitat and and enrich your uh, your biodiversity in this Wabanaki Acadian forest region, it is unique in the sense that it is a blending of more northerly cold tolerant species that are typically found in the boreal forest, along with more southerly affiliated species that we typically find to the south of us. Any kind of management that promotes those species that are more resilient to the effects of climate change, that is to say the ones that are mostly found to the south of us, those southerly affiliated species, that's likely to be a, a winning strategy. You should ask yourself as a landowner, what are your ambitions? What do you want from your land? And when talking to those contractors, make sure that their ambitions meet your own. So there are a few questions that you can ask them. How will you protect the regeneration that you can see here around me? How will you protect the soils? What trees, if any, do you plan on leaving? And if they answer honestly, you should get it in writing in a contract that way you know that they are beholden to what they have told you. We've got already hemlock and red spruce and yellow birch and red maple, and those are all, you know, long, long-lived intermediate tolerant species. Many of these trees survived this hurricane, they're going to survive the next one too. The drive to over-harvest in these situations should be tempered with some caution on, on the part of the forest owner. Costs of things like road access and upgrading can easily outweigh the value of the timber that might be laying in your forest. So some safety considerations that woodlot owners uh, should be taking into account when entering their woodlot would be to keep their eyes up and their ears open. Wind-thrown trees can be particularly dangerous. There could be other trees or branches hung up, still up in the air within other trees, and you never know when those are going to let go and come down. It may be that a branch fails or it may be the next high wind, but really you don't know. Limbs that are unstable, root systems that are unstable. Your butts of your trees are fractured and split, so when you go to cut them, they may twist or, or roll on you in an unexpected way. And as you release weight from the top of your trees, especially those that have been wind thrown and still have the root collar attached, they will try and stand themselves up. There's a spring action there. These large root masses like the ones that are behind me, oftentimes when you release a stem from the top of that, those will slide back into place, often unexpectedly. That could pose a threat to anyone attempting that work. So that work should be left for forestry professionals who are trained in how to do that safely. The climate is changing. We're already seeing some of the effects. There are some things we can do to hedge our bets though. Lean into complexity and lead into diversity. Try to manage for a diversity of species and a diversity of structures and ages in your woodlot. And that will lead to overall greater complexity and therefore more resilience overall. Ecological forestry is just as important now as it was before the hurricane. We have to think strategically about how to future-proof our forests. If possible, you should try and promote the growth of more wind tolerant species. So species such as white pine, yellow birch, uh, beech, maple, things that have a stronger root mass. It's a good time to start talking to your neighbors and considering the impacts that what you do on your property is also affecting them. Contractors should be trying to leave as many trees standing as they possibly can. You may want to change your practices and do more gap shelter woods and more uneven treatments because that it has higher wind resistance than even shelter wood harvesting or commercial thinning or even sometimes single tree selections. Most of the trees are down, you have a wide area. All you need to do is clean these trees that are downed and you have a trail giving you access to other damaged areas of your woodlot. While doing this, the contractor should also be protecting regeneration, uh, protecting exposed soils. So a way that they can protect exposed soils is avoid wetter periods 
um, suspend work after rain or during rain periods, or placing slash or woody debris in an area like that to better cushion it. Uh, they should not be dropping trees or placing trees on regeneration or tracking their equipment over that regeneration. Um, that way we can promote a better, healthier, more diverse forest. One thing that's clear is how unclear climate change is. We think we know a lot about the effects of climate change and what it means for our forests, but um, you know the, the scenarios and the projections are all subject to change. As forestry professionals and organizations, we're really trying to build the best resources possible for landowners to give good advice in managing for things like hurricane damage or other climate change um, impacts. So this video is the start of that, and we hope that you'll find it useful, but um, watch this space for more because we are continually trying to build more specific recommendations and guidance for landowners in the region. It won't be easy to decide what you should do regarding hurricane recovery, but there are many nonprofit organizations, woodland owner cooperatives, and charities that can help you figure out what values are most important to you and what the best plan is for your woodland.